Um, uh, so thank you for joining us today. And we are here uh, with the Division for Research um, with CEC. And we are really excited that you're here for our first webinar in our Spring 21 webinar series, um, which will be held on Fridays, um, uh, 12 to 1 Eastern Standard Time. And so this one is on um, the full five years, and we're looking at um, for um, uh, this webinar series, really looking at our pre-tenure and tenure um, faculty and looking at what it takes with that academic career trajectory. So um, this webinar, uh, this couple webinar series, um, these are really going to be um, myself, uh, Brie Jimenez and Sarah Powell, both in Texas, uh, University of Texas at Austin, Sarah and myself in Arlington, and we'll be kind of your moderators and um, bringing you through these couple webinar series. And we have some wonderful esteemed colleagues here today to share some of their stories with you as well. Um, this webinar series, like I said, is brought to you through DR. And um, we are excited to be able to offer this through our uh, knowledge utilization and our communication and publications committees. And um, if you're interested, uh, you know, these, we are bringing these to you through DR. And if you're interested in making a small donation for DR to continue with um, this programming and similar programming, um, you can visit us through our website um, and also through this uh, URL to be able to make a small donation, of course, a dollar, anything like that is, is um, well received, but of course not it's not mandatory or anything like that. So, um, and, and think about joining DR um, and, um, you know, to, to support your journey as a researcher in special education. So today we will start in our four webinar series on the pre-tenure series. Um, and today we'll be looking at your timeline um, and talking about as a new faculty and um, some of your planning for pre-tenure. Um, we'll then start to look at the research agenda next week and then moving into teaching and service in the tenure committee. So hopefully you can join us for all four webinars, but if not, um, we understand. And we also will be recording these webinars and posting them on our YouTube channel. So you can um, go back and watch it again or um, share with your colleagues and um, students. And we will be meeting on Fridays. So hopefully you can join us. Make sure that um, we are, we will be moderating the chat box and um, please post any questions that you have, um, specific questions, more general questions, and we'll definitely be either answering them in the post um, in the question box, but also potentially, um, you know, um, uh, helping moderate some of these questions. So please um, look at the chat box, open it up and ask questions away. We want this to be as interactive as possible and um, really be able to have conversations with you. So uh, first I would like to introduce uh, Michael Solis um, and Michael, maybe you could um, tell us a little bit about the pictures that you've chosen to put in here and um, a little bit about maybe what those icons might stand for down there with the White House and looks like a queen. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, can y'all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, good. So uh, I'm very happy to be here today and I wanna thank the D Division of Research for organizing this event. Uh, these are some of my dear friends and colleagues at uh, a place that we like to visit in San Diego um, called the Silver Fox when uh, many of us come for PCRC conference. And then to the right of that is uh, some hiking that I've done here in Southern California in one of my, my favorite areas uh, in the Springs Trail outside of Temecula. And so um, those icons down there, one kind of neat thing that I've experienced is I've been to events where uh, the Queen of England was present, another event um, where the Pope was present, and then um, I met Bill Clinton on the streets of Arkansas right after he became president uh, in 1992. So 
I've met a, a president, a queen, and a pope. <laughs> wow. Um, thanks. And you'll notice that little icon popping up a little bit later in our, um, in our presentation today, too. Thanks, Michael. And thank you for being here. Um, Emily, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, your pictures here and a little bit about yourself. Yes. Well, I clearly have a very literal interpretation of direction. So um, <laughs> when I was asked to give like a picture and then a fun fact and then um, something to kind of represent my journey. So my name is Emily Bauck and I'm a faculty member. I'm a professor at Michigan State University. And so that is a picture of myself with my family, my husband and my two children at Hogwarts. And that's pretty much if I'm not working, I'm with them. And so uh, that was just a, a fun picture of something that I don't do in my daily life. Um, and then I just kind of showed my journey. I actually got my PhD from Michigan State and then I worked someplace else and then had the, for eight years and had the opportunity to go back. So it was kind of like a, a full circle experience for me, which I was um, very pleased to be able to come back to the state of Michigan. And then the softball one is they asked for, Sarah asked for a fun fact. And so I, the fun fact that I usually share with my students is that I held a record in um, the state of Michigan for softball with for sacrifice bunts. So that's always my fun fact that I share with, um, with students. So that's kind of my page. Thank you. And Michael, Herbert, Herbert. Uh, actually, I, uh, thanks Brie. I pronounce my name Bear. like, like Thank one. You. I knew I was doing it wrong. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. Thanks. Um, so, you know, I'm Michael A. Bear. I'm an associate professor at the University of Nebraska. I'm interested in writing. Um, I have a, a group of friends um, that, that we do a book club together. Um, but then we decide that we want to do things outside the book club. And so, you know, we've gone indie racing. And then that's a, a picture of the group of us when we were uh, getting ready to do some uh, ropes course, which was, which was really fun. Um, so we just try to do different things um, to keep ourselves and, you know, we haven't done anything in the last year. So it's kind of uh, a little bit like I look at this a little longingly, like I can't wait to get back to those things. Um, but uh, and then the the uh, there's a Hogan on the left hand side. And uh, when I was asked about the fact that um, not a lot of people know uh, is I lived on the Navajo reservation for uh, for a year and I taught school there and I had the opportunity to help build a Hogan. Um, and I think I'd be a builder if I would if I wasn't a researcher because I've I've done like a lot of habitat for humanity. I've like built, uh, you know, worked on a house in Michigan. I worked on a house that was built on stilts in Louisiana. Um, so it, it's uh, so I think that's probably what I would do in an alternate career, maybe. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you. Um, so today we are just honored to have all three of you here to share your journey and share your stories. Um, and um, we are really focusing this session on the full five years. And so first of all, um, we, you know, yay, you've got a job. Uh, you know, all that hard work and all that, you know, lost sleep has come to fruition. And you've got a job um, in higher ed. And so you spend your first year, you know, your second year, your third year, and you're building up all of this. But sometime right around here in your third year, you're going to go under some sort of midpoint review. And you've probably been getting feedback along the way from your department, from your school of education or your school that you're working in. Um, and now we're, you know, we're kind of on the way. So we're starting to get a little bit of feedback here. And now you've spent your fourth year and your fifth year. But, you know, we talk about six years often when we talk about tenure, but really, you know, it's right here about your fifth year where you're identifying who your letter writers are and you're starting to actually get your packet, um, package all put together. So when you really look at it, you have about five-ish full years to get all of that stuff together, to then submit your tenure package. And then that last year is really, it's all kind of in the works and you're getting your decision back during that. So when we talk about tenure and we talk about this whole process, you know, kind of identifying it's those five years getting to that point, sometimes even almost four and a half, because you're starting to get all that stuff together. 
Um, and where are you to be able to, you know, make sure that you are progressing along the way and, and being successful in meeting the goals that you have, the goals that your university has. So we are so happy to have, um, you know, our uh, esteemed colleagues here today to talk about their journey and really talk about that full five years and, and how, um, what is it that they, that they did to, to be so successful? That's right, Bree. So in this session today, we asked our um, awesome members uh, to talk about what it was their timeline from starting a position to submitting their tenure package. And then how did they plan for some of those milestones to tenure? So we're gonna break these down into two categories, first focusing on their timeline and then focusing on those milestones. So in terms of the timeline, we're going to talk about how did people plan for those five full years? And there is an asterisk there because we know that it's not always five years for everyone. Um, but, you know, you, you do have a limited amount of time before you are ready to submit for tenure. Uh, we're going to talk about some of those hiccups encountered along the way. And then how did you adjust to those hiccups? So the first thing we're going to get into is planning. So how did you plan from the beginning of your first year until submitting your package? So those little uh, things that we talked about earlier, those unique facts about Michael, Emily, and Michael. So today, anytime we see the White House, we'll be thinking this is a comment that Michael Solis submitted to this session today. Anytime we see that bat, our bunter Emily, um, that's a comment from her. And Michael A. Bear, I'm so glad I chose a hammer for you. And now that you said you want to be a builder, I feel like that was a perfect choice and we'll see a hammer in some of those quotes later. So in terms of planning from the beginning of your first year until you're submitting your package, Michael Solis, you said you set an annual goal of four to five publications a year. How did you determine that? So I, I interviewed very widely when I started looking for a position and um, the, what, you, what you're consistently told during the interview process is that on average, you should think about having about two uh, publications per year as part of your productivity. And so to be on the safe side, um, I, I set a goal of doubling that um, as being four or five publications per year. Um, I also, in terms of the federal grants, um, my, my strategy was to uh, make sure that my grant submissions were very closely aligned with uh, my research rec record and very targeted, uh, which is different than other people who, who kind of throw a broad net with their, their grant submissions. Mm. Uh, but I wanted to just do a couple and have them be uh, very, very targeted and closely aligned to, to my area of expertise. Mm. And Emily, you said a pretty similar thing to Michael Solis. Can you tell us a little bit about where, how you settled on some of these numbers in terms of your planning? Yeah, so um, my first institution where I worked, Purdue, our department chair sat us down when we first got hired and said, you need three publications a year to feel safe. And um, since then, we don't say that at Michigan State, we don't give a number. I love the fact that he gave us a number because it was like, I have a concrete. And so in my mind, if three made you feel safe, then really then more than that should be my goal. And so I became like, I need to get four or five years because safe wasn't where I wanted to be. I wanted to be uh, above safe. And so that's kind of how I sat at my number. Um, and then I think it's as starting off and as I'll tell later, I had young children starting off. Um, it became challenging to think about how you can collect enough studies in you know uh, original research studies to get four or five publications a year, particularly if you're trying to establish um, collaborations. And I moved into an environment where I didn't have a lot of collaborations to begin with. And so that's where I became focused on this idea of diversifying my portfolio so that I was going to be, um, have, I was gonna to try to have multiple data collection, original data collection research studies. I also got involved with some secondary data analysis so that I didn't have to go out in the fields to collect, but I could be there and say, oh, I already, the, the data already exists. I just have to run analyses on this. Um, and then also thinking about practitioner articles and systematic reviews so that if I wanted to get that five, four or five or, or more, that I had to try to think strategically. And that meant trying to go across a variety of different venues for publications. Now, Emily and Michael Solis, uh, we have a lot of people in their first or second year of a tenure track position. And if I was sitting here watching this webinar, I would be overwhelmed right now. Four to five publications, how am I supposed to do that? So did you hit these benchmarks every year or would you describe these as lofty goals? 
That's a um, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I would I, say, I, yep, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> we'll let Emily go first. Yeah. Go oh, sorry. Uh, oh, I would say that um, it wasn't something that I hit on the first couple of years, but once I really got into this realm of trying to diversify, so that wasn't something that I learned coming in. It wasn't something I learned in grad school. It was something I found on the job, like, okay, how are you going to make this work now? Um, uh, and that's, I think one of the problems of grad school is I think we prepare people to be really good grad students and not to prepare them to be faculty. Um, and so I had to figure it out a lot on my own. And so the idea was, okay, you can't collect four or five studies by yourself a year if you're not, if you don't have any collaborations and it's trouble, it's challenging to get in the schools where I was. Um, and that really became, let's think about how you can diversify. And so that idea that financial, you diversify your portfolio so you don't put all your eggs in one basket. And once I did that, I was able to hit four to five a year consistently. Great. All right. So shoo, you didn't do that in the first and second years. What about you, Michael Solis? I, I was thinking about this um, prior to this event today, and I think if I were to retool this goal, I would retool it as being four to five submissions mm. each year. And I can say that I successfully submitted four to five um, submissions each year. I can't say I was successful in those all getting accepted on a yearly basis. But if you okay. go back and you look at my, uh, my record, I consistently have had about four publications per year. And so, um, I, you know, we can't control what gets published, but we can control how many articles we submit. Mm. And I think that, as Emily said, there's a lot of power in learning how to do systematic reviews uh, because that's an easy way to collaborate across institutions. And it's also a very cost-effective way uh, to publish if you're if you're on a budget starting off you, you can get those types of publications out and uh, they pay big dividends with uh, how often they're cited mm, yeah that's a really good point and I really liked Emily's point too about diversifying your portfolio now Emily you also said something that you didn't learn everything you needed to in grad school to really help you be a successful assistant professor and you shared two great resources today would you like to comment on these resources and say why they were important to you sure so um, I don't know about you guys but when I don't know how to do something I I try to read about it. That's just my strategy. I, I, okay, what can I read to learn more? And so um, one of the things, the books that I found is what they didn't teach you in graduate school, which was a really quick book. And I was, it made things apparent that no one told me in graduate school. And also nobody even told me on my, when I started my job and things like, hey, if it's five years, you really don't have five years because you kind of have to think about the, how many times, how, how much you have to submit before it can be published. And an advanced publication, online publication helps that a little bit, but that book was super helpful because it allowed me to think very, um, to see things, you know, put things out there that people weren't telling me and, and then I could be strategic and, and then I'm a very strategic person. So when I could see things, I could say, I know how to strategize and get to where I need to go. Um, and the second one was how to write a lot. And I really like that book. Our department chair brought that in and we talked about writing goals. And so from an assistant professor, I joined a, within our department, a writing group and it wasn't reading or responding. It was setting goals and you had to set two week goals and then you had to come back and tell whether or not you met them. And my, in that goal was uh, a very scary um, full professor in my department. And so um, she, there was just no way I was not going to make a goal. It was extremely motivating because as a brand new assistant professor, I was going to make every single goal I put down because I was not going to show up every two weeks and tell this person that I didn't meet my goals. And so to me, these books um, were very helpful into con being very concrete and explicit about giving me ideas of what I could do to achieve where I wanted to go. That's awesome. So uh, Michael A. Bear, we now uh, want to include you in this conversation. Uh, one of the things you shared with us is you actually wrote down your five-year plan and dug it out and shared it with our group. So we thank you for that. Could you just take uh, you know, a few seconds or a minute to tell us how, how did you develop this five-year career plan very early on um, in, in your uh, pathway to tenure? Sure. So, um, you know, I don't know what resources are available at every university, but we have a, a, a program here at UNL that's called the Scholarly Enhancement Program. And it's something we could, as, as early assistant, assistant uh, professors, we could apply to be in the program. And part of that was developing a five-year plan. So it wasn't something that I like came up with on my own. It was something that, um, you know, uh, 
you know, other folks at the university um, who were mentoring and helping us uh, said, this is a good idea. And so, um, so I started to work on it. And as you can see, I, um, as, uh, as people can probably, who know me, like Sarah uh, knows me pretty well, I like to bite off more than I can chew. And, and often like I, uh, I, I always sort of overestimate what I can potentially accomplish. So you can see there that I've got like average six, six publication submissions per year. Um, and then, uh, and did yeah. you, did you meet that goal, Michael? I just want to, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't meet it. I think okay. I, I averaged probably four publications per year. Um, in, in the, my final year of, uh, of, you know, as, as I was going up for tenure, I published, uh, seven papers that year. So I, I hit that you know, at one point, but, it, but it's, it's not really a sustainable uh, goal. Hmm. You know? okay. so, right. so I don't recommend, you know, like, Again. it's <laughs> nice to, like shoot for the stars, but like, don't, don't try to go that high. It's, it's not really uh, feasible. And you're just going to like, be, you know, kind of disappointed with yourself if you, if you go that high. Um, and so, you know, but basically, you know, we, I, I, I put that down and, and we, we, we thought about like lots of different areas. So our teaching, our, um, our uh, you know, mentoring of doctoral students, uh, you know, uh, managing or, or obtaining grants, you know, things like that. Um, so, so we really thought about each of these categories and, um, and wrote down what, what did I think was sort of an achievable goal. You all do likewise. What's that? Um, go ahead. Was there a question for Michael Hebert? All right, if there's a question, uh, put it in the chat or do feel free to unmute and ask that. And Michael, you also shared uh, like breaking this down by year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. Did you also mm -hmm. develop, it, develop that with the scholarly enhancement program or did you do this? I did, yeah, it was all part of the same document. So they said, okay. you know, come up with your five year plan. What do, you, what do you think you want to accomplish? And then try to break it down year by year, you know? And so looking ahead like that was great. Um, and, you know, really you have to know that it's, um, it's flexible and you're going to have to revise it over time because you, there are going to be some things that you hit and some things that you don't hit. It was actually kind of fun to pull this out and look at it because I haven't looked at it in, in years now, but, um, but, you know, it's, I, I realized that there are places that I had to, had to revise my expectations for myself and, and others that maybe I had to sort of set new goals because maybe I accomplished uh, some of those goals. So, um, but it was a really good exercise and it, and I feel like it really sort of, helped me think about all of the different areas that I needed to work on um, throughout the year and, and, you know, and over time, you know, so mm -hmm. it was really kind of like a nice exercise to kind of, um, to kind of really sort of set, set the plan for what I was going to do and to, and to know what I sort of expected from myself. Uh, Michael A. Bayer, one question that's come in from the chat is uh, when you talk about submitting six manuscripts, and I know Emily and Michael have also talked about submitting those, those aren't all first author papers, right? No, those no, are, no way. okay. Yeah, so can you I tell mean, like a little bit, like maybe some of those are papers with your students or with other colleagues? That's right. So, um, so I, uh, I, I published a lot with students. I publish a lot with colleagues. Um, I have um, collaborations within my department, um, you know, collaborations with mentors. And I, I feel like, you know, if you're, if you're starting out in a department, one really uh, great strategy is to start talking with, with uh, other, you know, uh, more senior level folks in your department and talk about collaborations because, because they want to help you. They want you to be successful as well. And so, you know, they might have projects that you can contribute to and things like that, that you can sort of, um, uh, start to build your publication record with them. I also collaborate a lot uh, um, outside of my university. So I uh, collaborated, uh, Sarah, Sarah and I went to uh, Vanderbilt together. And so uh, we were doctoral students together and we had a lot of conversations. So I, I, I actually published with her quite a lot. And other um, folks that I went to grad school with as well, I, I, I published with them. And so I have a lot of like cross university collaborations. And so I'm not always first author on those, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. one, one or the other of us will take the lead on a, a publication. Um, and then of course, I do have my own research lines that I'm like collecting my own primary data or I'm doing a systematic review. Um, and so, uh, so I do have some first authored or, so, or sole authored publications that, that are on my record. So just having like a variety of things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like Michael said, you can't control everything, right? If, if you're collaborating with others, 
you know, you don't, you can't always control the timeline that everybody else is on. So yeah. you, you know, it may be unrealistic sometimes to, to, you know, submit as many publications as you, um, as you have a goal for, but it's nice to have a goal to shoot for. Agreed. Now, another question that's come in from the chat from both uh, Jihoon and Florina. And Emily, I'm going to ask you this question. Um, this question is about submitting to high level journals, like tier one level journals, or it, do you submit to a mix of tier two and three journals? Like uh, Fl Florina really wants to know about like those high impact factors and how, how you kind of balance that with your uh, initial submissions with your publications. Yeah, so when I start to write a manuscript, I always say, what is my target journal? And then what is my second backup? And to me, it's, I my my number one question I always ask myself is what is the best target audience? Yes, impact is in fact important. Yes, the tier is important, but I wanna make sure that it's going to the best tar target audience. And so I guess I would try to say, again, I look to diversify. I definitely want tier one um, and I do submit to tier two, but I always ask myself, what is the best audience? What do I think is the most appropriate audience to receive um, my work. And that's how I make my decision. But I always start off having a plan A, B, and C before I start writing any manuscript. And I think we're going to see, uh, you shared an artifact with us that we're going to see in a few slides about that. All right. Um, so just moving along here. Uh, so what were some of the hiccups you encountered along the way? Um, Emily, I want to start since you're already unmuted with us. Uh, you had uh, your family while you were in grad school and while you were on a tenure path. So could you comment briefly about how that affected uh, your plan? Yeah, so I, as I said, I had my first child during my second year, and I actually literally got word that I got tenure the day I was having my my second my um, second child. So one of the things that impacted me is that um, I was very clear from the beginning that I was going to have a work life balance. So when I was at work, I was pretty much almost 100% devoted to work. So I, as I said in one of the early quotes, I really didn't go out to lunch. I didn't I didn't do a lot of socialization. I did a lot of um, when I was there, very focused on what I needed to do so that I could maintain the idea that. I would drop my children, child off at um, preschool or, or daycare, you know, um, at about 8, 8.30, and I would be home by between 4 and 4.30 every day, and then that would be time with them. And so I just changed what I did during, what I can control. I changed what I did during the time I was at work to maximize my productivity. Wow, re really good advice there. Uh, Michael Solis, uh, you changed jobs. So how did that uh, kind of put a hiccup in your pathway to tenure? Yeah, so, so one thing that I was told about your initial job is that um, when your record is being reviewed, everyone kind of receives one mulligan. So if you want to change jobs one time before you go up for tenure, that's completely reasonable. And um, thanks to Sarah leaving the University of Virginia and coming to Austin, uh, I was fortunate enough to get her position at the University of Virginia. Uh, my goal was to move back out west after leaving UT Austin. And when I saw the opportunity at, at UC Riverside, um, I applied. And um, so it set my timeline back a bit, uh, despite the UC policy being that you can go up for tenure whenever you choose to, which is very different than UVA. Uh, the advice I got from the Dean and from my mentor uh, Dr. Randy O'Connor was to wait an extra year and build a track record at that institution in terms of teaching and research prior to going up to make sure that it's a slam dunk. And so it did set my timeline back a bit, um, but it, was, it, it wasn't a, a huge issue for me overall in my career. Okay, that's good. That's good to know because I know you know a lot of people have that question as they look to perhaps changing jobs at some point in their first few years in their career. And uh, Michael A. Bear, I appreciate you for being very honest with this quote that you provided. Uh, you said that very early on, you were teaching a brand new course and the course evaluations were not exactly what you wanted them to be. So can you tell us a little bit about that hiccup and what that meant for you? Yeah, so I, um, you know, I mean, I, I came in with a lot of teaching experience um, at the uh, elementary school level. Um, and then I um, had really great teaching reviews at, um, uh, you know, in my doctoral program when I, when I taught both uh, at the, you know, at a master's level and then I, I co-taught a doctoral course. 
And so I think I was a little bit over, I guess, overconfident about my teaching ability. And I had to teach a new course and I had, um, hadn't really like developed a brand new course on my own before. And so um, I, I feel like I just didn't put, I didn't really know enough about how to, how to do that. And I, and I didn't go, I didn't look for help enough. Right. And so I ended up with um, with course ratings that I felt like were really uh, they weren't poor, um, but they were they, they weren't good. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And and I and so I, I felt like um, it really, you know, I was worried that that was going to reflect on me very poorly, you know, when I was going up for my third year review or for uh, for tenure. Um, and it really made me reevaluate, um, you know, the need to prepare. Um, really well, and to get feedback um, from students along the way in your course. Mm -hmm. So not just at the end when you get your course evaluations, but um, I asked them, you know, uh, about, you know, now I ask my students about assignments. I ask them at midpoints. I'll ask them sort of at, at three, three quarter or three, you know, each third of the course. I'll be like, how are things going? How do you, you know, how, is, how do you feel about the course structure? That sort of thing. And I use that feedback to sort of uh, build uh, my courses now. And I also decided at that point to, um, to participate in the peer review of teaching project that we have here at UNL. Oh, cool. and, um, and so, yeah, and, and it was great because we could, we could get uh, feedback from other uh, peers. Um, and I, and I could also reach out to a teaching mentor and kind of uh, think about how to hone my, my uh, teaching uh, at the college level. And so I, I that uh, really worked wonders for me and my course evaluations are really great now. And so, um, so I feel uh, like, like sometimes you need to make adjustments. Sometimes you're gonna, you're not gonna be quite um, hitting the mark that you set for yourself, um, and you know, uh, and that's okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's a really nice segue to adjustments. And so we talked about adjustments that you made to your research, your teaching, um, and your service. And so Emily, uh, you said like I've I've had this problem too. Challenges for doing research in schools. So what are some of the research adjustments that you made on uh, on your pathway to tenure? Well, so I found that that uh, what I might be interested in wasn't always connecting with the schools. And so I try, so I really adjusted to talking with teachers and schools about what 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 are some of the challenges you face? And then kind of thinking about how that aligned with what my, I was interested in researching and kind of forging a new path collaboratively. So I may be interested in this, but a school well, X, but a school is interested in Y. So how can we come together to find Z to have this a mutually beneficial experience that I'm it's connected to my research target, but it's also helping the schools or the teacher or um, the, you know, the community that partner that I'm involved with. Love that idea, really um, help, helping everyone involved there. Uh, in terms of teaching, Michael, you talked just a little bit about this teaching adjustment. Was there anything else that you wanted to add in terms of how you adjusted your teaching through your pathway to tenure? Yeah, so I, I you know, I think, I think about teaching a lot. Um, is it was the whole reason uh, I was a teacher before I uh, before I went into my doctoral program, and um, so teaching is really important to me. And um, and now I sort of think about teaching; it like permeates everything that I do, right? Um, and, and I feel like I've got to adjust what I'm doing in for various learners, you know. So I adjust at the if I'm teaching an undergraduate course or a master's course or a doctoral level course. Um, all of those learners uh, are there for different reasons, and they have different levels of motivation and um, things like that. And, and so, um, so I have to adjust uh, things, and I have to think about how um, you know there may be differences in how I maybe approach the content for these different learners. On the other hand, there may be um, some things that are like uh, very similar about how I how I how I provide scaffolding or how I um, introduce topics or things like that 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 can be really helpful no matter what level of learner they they are. Um, this year, I had to think a lot differently, of course, about online teaching. You know, so you know, I've been uh, teaching uh, synchronous courses online on Zoom, and um, and that's very different than the way that I conceptualized uh, online classes before the pandemic. That might have been more asynchronous in nature, and so you know, I feel like I've had to sort of think a lot about how to adjust um, uh, my teaching. But I also want to mention really quickly that I also think about like um, training my research assistants, um, you know, working with, uh, uh, you know, my graduate students outside of the classroom 
all as other teaching experiences that are really important. So mm -hmm. teaching to me doesn't just sort of like stay within the classroom. I've got to think broadly beyond the classroom. That's uh, a great, well. great point. And then in terms of adjustments to service, uh, Michael Solis, can you tell us a little bit about how you adjusted your service uh, for your pathway to tenure? So again, I'd, I'd emphasize um, if, if you have a mentoring program at your university to uh, take advantage of that and, and connect with that individual on a regular basis, because uh, they'll provide you that institutional knowledge that will help you to navigate um, each university's kind of idios idiosyncrasies. And so when I arrived at, at UC Riverside uh, and met with Dr. O'Connor, one thing that she, this was her advice to me was to make sure that in, rather than just having service focused at the university level, to think about it being focused at different levels of community. So university level, uh, local, state, and national. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that has paid big dividends for me. State level has helped me connect and to build more of a community uh, of scholars here in California than I would have uh, otherwise. Hmm. That's great. All right, so we're going to move on to our second big question to think about today, which is how did you plan for different milestones to tenure? So we'll reflect on yearly milestones, midpoint milestones, and then we're gonna talk about that 11th hour, right before you submit your tenure package. Um, so in terms of those yearly milestones, did you have yearly check-ins with people in your department? Uh, Michael Solis, I will talk to you because you already mentioned this mentor, we'll continue the conversation, but um, how did you arrange these check-ins with your mentors? Did they, did they propose these check-ins? Did you propose these check-ins? Was it something the university mandated? Can you tell us a little bit about those? I think as the mentee, it's really important that you take the initiative. And uh, with both mentors I had at both institutions, it, it was really up to me um, to say, would you mind us having a monthly meeting to just kind of check in with each other to help me establish my presence here? And they were both, um, I was very fortunate with Marsha Invernessy and Randy O'Connor uh, being so generous with their time. Uh, but I think it's really up to you to, um, make those connections and to, to uh, keep yourself on that path. Mm -hmm. I'd also just like to say that it, it's important that you, that institutional knowledge is very, very important. Um, the differences between the University of Virginia and the University of California in terms of policies and traditions uh, are vast. And it took me a while to make the adjustment from UVA to UCR um, because of those differences. Mm, I think that's a really good point. And, um, and I think you being active in terms in terms of seeking out mentorship, uh, you know, people are not always going to come to you. So you need to go to those people. Uh, Emily, I'm going to ask you to, uh, you, you are answering this in the chat, but uh, Becca in the chat said, you know, what do you do if you don't have mentorship at your university, either structured or maybe you just uh, don't want to pair up with some people at your university. So could you answer that question for our group? Yeah, so one of the things that I did, as I said early on, um, I got involved in service. So I got involved in um, the Division on Autism and Developmental Disabilities within CEC, including getting on the board um, my second year as an assistant professor. And to me, wow. that created great opportunities to have mentorship with colleagues within the field. And so not only could I see them, you know, year in in normal times yearly or two or three times a year and have informal conversations, but then I also felt extremely comfortable reaching out to them with questions or issues that came out. And so um, to me, I can't be, can't say positive, more, enough things positive to say about getting connected with um, divisions within CEC or a professional organization to create mentoring, informal or formal mentoring opportunities outside of an institution. I, I agree with you totally. And Michael A. Bear, tell us a little bit about your yearly check-ins and how those reflected to the five-year plan that you shared with us. Sure. So, um, you know, I, I had, like like Michael uh, mentioned and, and uh, Emily also touched on mentors, I um, also had mentors um, that I worked with. But one, one of my mentors happened to be my department chair. 
And so we would check in uh, at annual review time, you know, and, and I think it's a great time to sort of talk to your uh, department chair and kind of figure out what their expectations are. And, and they can, you know, um, they have a lot of that institutional knowledge that Michael was talking about. Um, and so they can help really help guide you. And so I had a really great relationship and I would use that annual review period to really sort of think about uh, my, my progress. And, um, and I would talk with her about the goals that I were setting for myself for the following year um, and whether or not they were reasonable and aligned with, you know, um, you know, helping me to get to uh, where I needed to be for tenure. So That's great. Um, so, Emily, some of the artifacts that you shared with us that um, I think are just absolutely awesome is kind of going back to these like a one year and the goals that you make within one year, you shared here in the middle, your goals from September through July. Do you want to talk, comment a little bit on, you know, how did you order these? Did you meet all of these goals within each of these months? Oops, I'm sorry. Tell us a little bit about how you developed this. Yeah, so a couple of years in, I figured half the battle is being organized. And so I decided to set up goals. And so statistically, I was like, okay, you know, if you need three and I want, you know, four or five publications a year, then I need to be submitting at least double that, right? Statistically, again, thinking that half to one fourth might hit. Um, and so then I would kind of lay out. So I'd sit there at the, in the beginning in August and kind of think about what projects am I working on and when can I reason, reasonably think that I can complete them or if I'm doing them with collaborator, collaborators or students, when can we um when can we be done? And so then I'd kind of set a monthly goals for what I was going to do. So I would have check-in points for myself and for my students and any other collaborators, like this is the goal and how can we achieve it? And then um, adjust as needed. And so that was kind of really what I would do at the beginning of each year and then kind of revisit it every couple of months if I'm on track or if I need to make adjustments. And I would kind of pin this next to my wall, right next to where I was writing. So I would have to see it on a daily basis. Uh, I, I think this this type of organization is absolutely essential. And over here on the right hand side, um, thank you for sharing this with us. I, I didn't want to uh, highlight, oh, you, you know, you got a rejection from this journal, but your level of organization for tracking your manuscripts uh, is something that I, I want to, to do. And so can you tell us a little bit about the, this page that you shared and how you keep track of all your submitted manuscripts? Sure. So I kind of have a working document and I do this on a monthly basis. So I take all my articles that are submitted in press and published and then grants and I update it monthly. So I, I have the information about what the, the number is when I submit, where I've submitted, um, what the date is so I can make sure I can go back and check if it's been three months. Do I need to follow up with the yeah, journal? Super and then great. keeping yeah. everything organized. And then I kind of shift. So once a month, shift them from the in press, from the submitted to the impress or impress the published or if they were rejected and I haven't had a chance to redo them yet there's a whole special page for need to come back to to address and so again um, if I'm in my office on a on a regular basis which I'm not now I have this hanging up so I can do quick okay. pencil changes but um, this to me helps me keep organized and stay on track that organization again as you said is key uh, before we go on to the midpoint review, a question came in from Jihoon about balancing writing time between publications and grant writing. Michael Solis, would you like to comment about how, how do you decide if you want to spend time writing grants or would your time be better spent writing a publication? I was just thinking about that. And basically, I work on manuscripts uh, until the call for IES comes out <laughs> and then I drop my manuscripts and I uh, work on the IES submission uh, until it's submitted and then I go back to manuscripts. And so I, I, I really approach that uh, seasonally that I have a, a manuscript period of time and then I have uh, my, it's basically my summertime that I'm, I'm working on grant submissions. Okay. Yeah, I do the same thing too. I, I really plan that summer is spent on grant writing. And so that means that I have to be really productive the rest of the year yeah. for manuscript What's writing. That? Yeah. Are you in a meeting? Hold on. I'm going to mute someone here. So, uh, okay. All right. So let's move to the midpoint review. So we have some time for questions here. Uh, many universities do a midpoint review. Sometimes it's formal and written up and sometimes it's informal. Um, we asked if this midpoint review changed your, rejector, tra your trajectory. Uh, Michael Solis, you said you didn't really have this. Uh, Emily, you said you had this, but you were on target. And uh, just moving forward, uh, Michael Bear, you actually shared your midpoint review. Um, so I wanted to, to show this to our group today. 
uh, because I thought this was awesome because it really sets the stage for your research statement in your tenure package. So could you briefly tell us a little bit about your midpoint review that you wrote up here? I kind of uh, uh, put rectangles around some of the headers that you have. So how did you develop this and how was this um, uh, helpful for you? Sure. So I, I think um, I had to put together, you know, a couple of things. Um, I had to put together, you know, a goal and I had to think of my research philosophy um, and I had to, um, you know, come up with a research statement. I also had to do a teaching statement and a service statement, um, but I think I just shared my research um, one with you. Is that right, Sarah? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. And so, you know, basically what I, uh, you know, I had to think about, um, you know, my my research and how I might want to present it, you know, during tenure. So it was a really nice exercise to think about at the midpoint, you know, what, what is the trajectory I'm on and what are the, what are my lines of research? So I thought of, you know, what would be, you know, how would I present my primary line of research? How would I provide um, my secondary line of research? Um, and I wrote paragraphs about that for my uh, mid-tenure review file. And that was really helpful because like Sarah said, I was able to take that and use it and revise pieces or, you know, I didn't necessarily use it in whole, but I took pieces and revised it for my tenure portfolio. So I felt like that was a, at, at the time it felt like, gosh, I've got to spend time writing this and I could be writing a manuscript, you know, um, or I could be writing a grant uh, proposal. Um, and so sometimes you feel like things might be like getting in the way of your productivity, but on, but I think that after doing it and reflecting on it, it really helped me stay on track and stay productive. So, so doing exercises like this or doing these kinds of midpoint evaluations of your work um, are worthwhile. And I know that your university asked for this, but I might suggest that if even if your university isn't asking for a formal submission, this might be a really good activity to do in your year three to see, you know, how well is your research statement for tenure uh, shaping up. And we're going to talk about statements for your your research statement for tenure in next week's webinar. So I have a question for all of our amazing panelists that uh, I didn't ask before this session. And I wanted to ask them, how did you feel at the 11th hour? And by that, I kind of mean, you know, as you were submitting your materials or, you know, maybe a month before that submission. So Michael Solis, would you like to tell us how you felt? Did you feel prepared? Were you nervous? You know, what, what's it like going through tenure? It's, I, I mean, it, it is a stressful process, um, but I, I mean, my philosophy is that you, you prepare as much as you can, and then um, you just have to go for it and have faith in the outcome. And uh, so, of course, I was, you know, nervous throughout the process, but I also had a pretty high level of confidence because um, I had exceeded what had been outlined as the typical expectations um, by individuals at the university. And so, um, you know, it, it is a nerve wracking process, um, but if you prepare and if you're as, as organized as Emily is and as Michael Abair is, um, you will be in, in good shape. Great. Uh, Emily, how did you feel at the 11th hour as you submitted your tenure package? Um, I felt really good. In fact, um, the most the, the most calmest thing was handing it over. I mean, I had because there's nothing you can do. And to me, it was all about trust in my colleagues and trust in my department. Um, I will say it wasn't my penultimate. So there was that little bit removal of um, complete stress. But um, it was very nice because my colleagues said, we feel very confident. And I, I just put my trust in my colleagues and my work and felt that it would stand on its own. Very nice. And Michael A. Bear, do you have anything to say about how you felt at the 11th hour? Sure. So, you know, I, I didn't know how I felt at the 11th hour until, um, until after I got tenure, you know, at, at the time I, f I told myself that one, I didn't, I was like, well, tenure shouldn't matter. I shouldn't care about tenure. If I do my job and if I'm doing the things that, that I want to do to help kids, then I'll get tenure. Right. And, and so, so I was like, I really shouldn't worry about the process. I should just kind of do my job. Um, and so I, and then, you know, like Michael said, I was like, well, I, I, I also sort of felt like I sort of exceeded the expectations, you know, set out for tenure. So I was like, I, I think I'm okay. 
but then after I, after receiving tenure, when I, when I got the word, it was I, this like relief wash washed over me and I didn't realize how stressed I really was, you know? Um, and, and so I think, you know, even when you feel like it might be like, um, oh, I've, I've hit the mark and stuff, it's still pretty stressful. And, and I think that you need to kind of like, try not to lie to yourself like I did and, and kind of like think like, okay, you know, this and, and be, be okay with being a little stressed and maybe do some things that can help you de-stress a little bit during the process. I agree. And, you know, Michael Solis shared one of his artifacts with us, um, and this is his research statement. And I think this really just sets up the case to join us next week as we talk about these research statements and what go into those. So just to review today, uh, we talked about your timeline across those five or maybe uh, more years. So you've really got to make a plan. You've got to plan for hiccups and then make adjustments to that. And then our group did a really nice job of talking about you know, yearly milestones, a midpoint milestone, and then how they felt at the 11th hour. So uh, now we have, we wanted to leave about 10 minutes. So we've got nine minutes, good timing here uh, for questions. So. Feel free to put your questions in the chat box. They can be directed to either Michael Solis, Mike Lebert, or Emily. Um, or you might have some generalized questions that you want to ask. Also, feel free to unmute and talk to us. So what questions are there? Uh, so one question that's already come in uh, is about selecting reviewers. I think that that might be letter writers. Um, that is moving ahead to some of our webinars, but I'm happy to get some feedback from our panelists today. Uh, how did you select uh, letter writers? Or I guess, were you able to provide feedback about your letter writers? And then how did you select those people for your tenure packet? Um, Emily, would you like to comment on that first? Yeah, so I was able at, at both institutions, I was able to give names. And so I know that, um, and then I chair our college RPT process now at Michigan State. So I have a good understanding. So, you know, giving names, half of them came from me, half of them came from the department or, um, you know, full professors within my area and things like that. And so what I did is early on, I just started a running list. I, I just love lists. So I started a running list of names and then I would continually like yearly go back and revisit this and think about uh, names of people at comparable or peer institutions that were pro, pro professors and then um, think about who I had relationships with. So I had this running list and then I would try to think about developing relationships because in my mind, it was always harder to say no to someone who you've met and you've engaged in a conversation is than somebody that you've never met. So my whole thing was um, to be strategic about making connections with people from whom I might ask. Agreed. Michael Bear, would you like to say how you chose uh, letter writers? Sure. So, um, you know, I, I thought a, a, a very similar to Emily, like think about who you have, who you have relationships with. And you can't um, include letter writers who, or at least at UNL, you, if you've published with somebody or worked with somebody, then you can't um, have them as a letter writer. So it has to be people that you know. Um, and so for me, that felt like since my area is writing, I really looked at you know other writing researchers who I knew and I respected their work, and um, and then I would um, you know meet at conferences and things like that, um, and maybe have developed some relationships with. Uh, another thing that I did is I talked to my um, my former advisor, you know, and and other folks that that are really you know sort of have a lot of experience in the field and um, and know a lot of people and they, they and you know he recommended some folks that he's like you know this person would be really conscientious and they would really be thoughtful and they would they would probably be a really nice uh, really give you some nice feedback and so that would be a good person to put on there and so you know I kind of um, you know relied on some recommendations for for folks as well. Great advice. Uh, Michael Solis, a question has come into the chat box, and I know you have answered it, but I'd like you to answer it for everyone else. Um, you changed jobs, and so uh, how, like, how many years did were you in when you changed jobs, and then how many years did you have to wait to get tenure at your new university? Tell us a little bit about that. I was at the University of Virginia for two years, and uh, I went up for tenure after my fourth year at University of California at Riverside. So it set me back um, one year, basically. Uh, I just put this in the chat. For every university, there's going to be a document that outlines the policies and procedures around uh, advancement and promotion. And you should make sure that you familiarize yourself with that document early 
so that you have a sense of um, what your options are. So again, at the University of California, um, it's up to each candidate to determine when they will go up during that six to seven year window. Uh, at the University of Virginia, it was very different. Uh, there, there was basically set policies that required a three year check uh, and I'm not aware of anyone at UVA who's gone up early. That's just not something that happens at that institution. And so pay close attention to those things uh, and it will help you figure out um, what, what your options are if you do decide to change jobs. Great advice. And Zachary, I like Michael Solis. I also changed jobs on my way to tenure. And so I was at the University of Virginia for two years and then came to the University of Texas. And the University of Texas is one of those institutions where the Dean at that point said, you are not allowed to go up early. So I knew coming to this university that it would be, I'm basically starting over and I have to do five full years. Now, during that time, I did show high levels of productivity. And so at some point I negotiated with the Dean to go up after the end of my fourth year at Texas, which would have been after like six years as an assistant professor. Um, so, and I know Bree talked about this in the chat, but when you are changing jobs, that is a conversation about your tenure clock that is absolutely necessary before you sign any paperwork. So you really know what you're getting yourself into. Um, a question. Be, yeah, yeah go ahead, Bree. You may yeah. not want to, I mean, it may not be that you're trying to go up early, depending yeah, on what's true. going on in your life or as you're transitioning, you may want to negotiate for another year. Mm -hmm. um, to help with that transition. So it, it kind of depends on the situation and what's going to best serve you and, and, Great point. Um, and making sure that you, you are, you know, advocating for what you might need to be your best researcher self when you go up. Um, yeah. The other question that just came up, um, that would be great to just talk about. And I know Emily, you mentioned it a little bit, but just sharing like your advice on work-life balance, because, um, you know, those first five years can be exhausting if you're constantly, um, you know, tracking all of this and trying to, to be ready. And do you have any suggestions or um, words of wisdom about that work-life balance? Um, uh, words of wisdom. Uh, I guess I just very much prioritize my time. I very much was, um, my husband is also an academia, so he used to make fun of me that you, I never went for coffee. And I was like, nope. Because when I go home, my life is going to be all about the child or the children. And so I'm going to do, I'm basically going to sit in my office and, and, and work from the moment I get there pretty much until the moment I leave. And then when I go home, it's going to be all about them. And um, I mean, and being very upfront and not being ashamed to be like, I will work a hundred percent of my time for you, except when I have something with my child. If I'm going to go to every school little party they have because they're only one young, young ones, um, and then just maintaining those boundaries. And so for me, um, I just very focused when I was there, very focused when I was home, and that's how I was able to um, be able to navigate my time. Is, is to be able to have that work life balance was just to be, be very firm with my boundaries. Any other thoughts? Um, I guess I, 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 I feel like it's weird for me to weigh in here because I feel like I don't have work-life balance now. So it's hard, <laughs> you know, like I work, a, I work, or probably work too much. One thing that I think I would say is that I sometimes probably work too much because I, I don't feel like it's work all the time. You know, um, what I, I, I have a lot of really close friends that I work with. Um, I, I have a lot of really great colleagues within my department and then of course across universities, like I mentioned. And, and so, you know, when I get together to work with people, I always kind of feel like it's also social, you know, and, and so um, for me, I, I sort of, try to mix, uh, mix in the work time with like more fun things, you know, with uh, the people that I work with. And, um, and so for me, I, I sort of strike a balance by um, not necessarily working less, but by making it more fun, you know. Wonderful. Um, thank you guys so much. This has been wonderful. And I know a lot of people are posting in the chat box too. Um, just about kind of the takeaways from today. And, and someone mentioned about how it just being kind of giving them the, um, the, the excitement and, and the, um, the, the oomph that they need to go into the next step. And I think that's probably it too, is just being able to have an opportunity to talk about this and hear from your journey 
um, as um, um, productive, um, amazing researchers in the field. So um, we thank you again for joining us and supporting DR with this webinar um, in the series. Our next series um, continues next week on March 5th, same time and uh, same link. And we will be talking more about the research agenda. And so some of the, what you've shared today really helped um, bring us to next week. And then we'll go ahead and, and continue on with our series. So um, just a reminder that all of these will be posted. We record them and they'll be posted on our YouTube channel. So you can go back and refer to them or share them with other colleagues who weren't able to be here today. Um, and um, Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Michael Solis. Thank you, Michael Ebert. And thank yeah, you, Emily thank Bauk. you. I really appreciate wonderful, it. Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks for having us. Thank I really appreciate the invite. It was, it was great. a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Great. Thank you.